Is there anybody that would, would just love to learn how to pray better? Does anyone want to, is there anyone that would like to learn how to be more effective in their prayer life? Because I want to talk about that today. And, and so I want you to see this scripture out of Ephesians where the Bible teaches us that there's all kinds of prayers that we can pray. It says, pray in the spirit in every situation. Use every kind of of prayer requ and request there is. Use every kind of prayer. Here's what I want you to notice with me, is that there's all types of prayers in the Bible. And the Bible is filled with prayers for us to learn from so that we can become more effective in our prayer life. God doesn't want us just to be able to have a one word prayer that just goes like this every now and then. Help! He wants to, he, now he hears that. Uh, he hears the cry of the righteous and he bends down to hear us. I'm grateful for that. But there are different kinds of prayer in the Bible that we can learn from. We learned about one of them last week. But today, um, I, I get the privilege of really sharing my favorite prayer. This is my favorite prayer in all of the Bible. The disciples were obviously watching Jesus pray one day and were attracted to what Jesus was doing because up to that point, they probably didn't know much about prayer and they were attracted to whatever Jesus was doing and Jesus taught them how to pray. And this is what he said. Pray then like this. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we also have forgiven our debtors and lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. Now listen, if you're new to online or in this church and you've never been to church before, you've probably heard of this prayer. You've probably heard somebody pray this prayer. So today, here's what I wanna call the message that I wanna say to you today, share with you today. It's praying God's will, God's way. Since there's every kind of prayer we're gonna learn from the best, we're gonna learn from Jesus, uh, from the Our Father prayer. Now, before I really learned how to pray, I was, I was a Catholic growing up, and I need my Catholic friends to help me out. This was pretty much the extent of my prayer life. Bless us, O Lord, and these thy gifts, which we are about to receive from thy bounty through Christ our Lord. Amen. Does anybody know that prayer? There's only a few Catholic friends in the room. All right. John, you and me. All right, here we go. So this, is, this was pretty much the extent of my prayer life up until I really learned how to pray from Jesus's prayer. This was it. We see some food, we learn how to pray, and we said this as fast as we could as kids so we could just get right after it. And I thought, well, you know, maybe you grew up and your parents would pray a prayer over you at night. And I thought, I wonder if the disciples' parents prayed a prayer like this over them. Said, now, now I lay me down to sleep. I pray the Lord my shape to keep. Please no wrinkles, please no bags and please lift my backside before it sags. Please no H spots, please no gray, and as for my belly, please take it away. Please keep me healthy, please keep me young, and thank you, dear Lord, for all that you've done, amen. How many of you wanna, if you don't know how to pray, that's a good one, you can pray that one. <laughs> so my guess, is, my guess is, is that all of us at some point in our life, have something to learn about prayer. In fact, even today, I still wanna learn. I still wanna learn how to pray. But I remember being in a season of my life where I had this desire. God, I want to learn how to pray. But I didn't know how to pray until I heard someone teach what I'm about ready to teach you. And it was 1986. And I heard someone teach on Christian television the Lord's Prayer. And it revolutionized my life. And it has been the pattern from which I have learned how to pray. It has been the pattern of which most of my prayer life consists of. And so I wanna take you through that today. I'm gonna, I'm, gonna give you, I'm gonna give you the seven points to be able to learn how to pray according to the way Jesus teaches us how to pray. And you see, he said this, pray then like this. Now this is important because especially for us Catholic kids, is we didn't, I didn't hear these words, pray then like this. What I heard was, as, as a kid, was memorize this and just say these words. And so I just memorized that and said those words, but that's not what Jesus was teaching. 
Jesus wasn't just saying memorize this prayer. What he's saying is, is, is pray like this. So pray, let this be a pattern. Let this be the ideas, the topics. Let this be the topics of which you cover in your prayer. So another translation says it in this manner. So in this manner. So uh, we, he didn't mean just to recite. He didn't mean that. He, he, meant, he meant to learn about the topics and he told us about what those are. And he said, our father in heaven. So we're gonna pray God's will, God's way. And the first thing is this, pray relationally, not religiously. Pray relationally, not Religi religiously. Now, the context of Jesus teaching us this prayer is centered around religious people, repetitive prayer life, and around Gentile people who didn't know God's prayer life. So it, that's the context. So it's people that just did the, our Father which art in heaven, hallowed be thy name, and repeating it, and other people who didn't have any idea who God was and didn't know how to pray. So Jesus begins and says these words. He says, our Father, pray like this, our Father, which art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. So he begins with this concept. Begin to relate to God relationally and not religiously. So you approach the Lord from a basis of relationship. How many of you are grateful he's the one who invites us into a relationship? He did not invite us into a religion. This is really important. He invited us into a relationship. So you are praying as a son or a daughter of God, not a slave. Okay, so you, you begin with this concept, our father, our father. So this is why scriptures like this mean so much. You've not received a spirit that makes you fearful slaves. Instead, you received God's spirit when he adopted you as his own children. Now we call him Abba, which is like daddy, Abba Father. So the teaching of the fatherhood of God takes a decisive turn with Jesus. For, for father, it was his favorite term for addressing God. I don't know if you know that about Jesus, but the gospels record for us that out of the lips of Jesus in the synoptic gospels, 65 times Jesus refers to God as father and in the gospel of John alone, over 100 times. So it's Jesus' favorite term to relate to God and he's teaching his disciples, this is how I want you to begin your prayer life. This is how I want you to begin how to learn to pray. Pray from a posture of a son or a daughter of God. Pray then like this, our Father. Abba, Father, I'm grateful that I'm not having to twist the arm of God, or to try to do some sort of religious activity. Like I learned religious activity as a kid, lighting candles and putting money and stuff. And, and like, okay, all of this stuff might get me out of somebody out of purgatory and get my prayers answered by praying over some beads. But I finally learned, you know what? God says all of that stuff, I tore the veil from the top to the bottom when my son was crucified. So you could approach God as a child. All right, then he said this. He says, pray then like this. So our father, we, have, we, we, we pray relationally and not religiously. But then he goes, he goes on. He goes, our father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Hallowed be your name. So begin with this. Begin with thankfulness and praise. So I, I typically will be like, good morning, father. Good morning, Jesus. And good morning, Holy Spirit. That will be how I will begin to address God for the day. Even, even if it's not really my prayer time yet, it's just good morning and I just address God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit. Just, just let him know I, I'm awake and I say good morning to God. All right, then I begin, anytime I'm, I'm beginning to just to approach God, I begin the way Jesus taught us to approach God. Hallowed be your name. So yes, I approach him relationally, but then I remember He's God Almighty. And I remember he's the creator of the universe. I remember he's the creator of heaven and earth. And nothing is too big for our God. 
And what I do is I remind myself who God is. This is important. I'm, I started today, does anybody want to learn how to be more effective in your prayer life? Jesus gives us a pattern. And that pattern begins not with our need, but with our praise. Okay, the pattern begins not with need, but it begins with praise. And so Jesus teaches us to praise the name of God. Now in Hebrew culture, names meant a lot. It meant identity. That's why often you would read, you'll read in the Bible, it'll say someone's name and then give the meaning of their name. Because it often would speak about who God had called them to be, who they, who they really were. And so God began to reveal himself to Moses when Moses cried out and said, God, you want me to be a leader of your people? Well, at least tell me who you are. Give me your name. And God begins a revelation of who he is and says this, tell them I am. Tell them I am. So it's, it's like this. I am fill in the blank. I am dot, dot, dot. Because God is too big for one name to contain, he begins with Yahweh. He begins with, or Jehovah, he be, which means I am. And then throughout the revelation of scripture, God will fill in the blank. He will, uh, he will reveal himself to an individual in a particular way like he did Abraham on Mount Moriah when he provided a ram caught in the thicket. So what did Abraham say? He goes, you are provider. So what he did is he goes, Jehovah or Yahweh, I am. And he filled in the blank with a revelation that God is provision. Jehovah Jireh, I am provision. Or Gideon, afraid, gets a revelation that God is peace. And he goes, I am. And he filled in the blank. Uh, Jehovah Shalom. And so throughout the Bible, we see the names of God and those names are given to us to give us understanding of who God is so we then get our faith enlarged and we can praise the name of the Lord. Now this is important because to, in order to pray in faith, and the Bible teaches us without faith, it's impossible to please God and that we need faith in order to have our prayers answered. So I believe this is why Jesus says, begin by hallowing the name of God, reminding yourself who he is so that your faith. You see, if you start with your need instead of your praise, the praise that is due him, you probably won't pray in faith. You'll pray in begging. And you'll just hope that God hears you. But Jesus says, no, 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 our Father, which art in heaven, hallowed be your name. Look at this, what, this is what Psalm teaches us. Um, it says, enter his gates with thanksgiving and his courts with praise, give thanks to him, bless his name. So how we, this is why we give thanksgiving and praise as we begin our prayer is because we do that out of remembering the names of God, who God is, your almighty God, your most high God, your Elohim, you are Jehovah, there you are King of kings and Lord of lords, that you are the Alpha, you are the Omega, you are healer, you are peace, you are provision, and you begin to just declare who God is. I'm here to tell you, if you will spend Spend some time doing that. If nothing else, your spirit man will get encouraged. You go, man, God is good. <laughs> now, it's much easier to thank God for who he is when you learn who God is. It's better to know the names of God, the characteristics of God, than it is just to say, praise God, praise God, praise God, praise God. Now, praise God is good. I do that a lot. Or hallelujah, sometimes that's all I can muster. But it's much more meaningful and has more depth to it when you say, praise God for you are. And you praise the name of the People are the same way. People appreciate when you say thank you. But they appreciate it more when you say thank you for being such a generous person because everywhere you go, you're always giving more than you're receiving. Oh, now it was something specific. 
Or I'm grateful for you, okay? And you're wondering, what are you, what are you grateful for? Or you finish the sentence and you say, I'm grateful for you because everywhere you go, the atmosphere changes. You share joy, and when I'm down, I get around your presence, and your joy gets on me. I am so grateful for your upbeat spirit. How many of you know there's a difference between saying I'm grateful for you and I'm grateful for you because of this? Same thing in your prayer life. So rather than just saying, praise God, praise God, praise God, praise God, or hallelujah, which is good, but then how about finishing the sentence and saying, God, I praise you because you are this. So what it does is it requires you to actually get to know God. It requires you to actually get to know who God is. Get acquainted with his name. Get acquainted with his character. Get acquainted with his characteristics. And you do that through reading the scriptures and finding out how God has revealed himself to us. So we begin with thankfulness and with praise. We enter his gates with thanksgiving. We enter his courts with praise. We give thanks to him and we bless his name. Hallowed be your name. Where do we go? Oh, by the way, Jesus, there are a lot of names. These are just for Jesus, by the way. And I got a lot of slides. So you'll have to rewatch the video to get if you're taking notes. We got Almighty and Alpha and Omega and Amen and Author of Life and Bread of Heaven and Bread of Life and Chief Shepherd in Christ. We have Consolation of Israel and Deliverer and Emmanuel and Faithful and True and Witness and the Gate and God and Good Shepherd and Heir of all things, High Priest, Holy and Righteous One, Holy One of Israel. We got Horn of Salvation, I Am, King of the Jews, Lamb of God, Last Adam. We got Light of the World, Lion of the Tribe of Judah, Lord, Lord of all, Lord of Lords and King of Kings, Lord of Glory, Man of Sorrow, Master Master, mediator, Messiah, morning star, our Passover lamb, pioneer and perfecter of our faith, prince of peace, rabbi, resurrection and life, righteous one, ruler of God's creation. We got savior, son of man, son of David, son of the most high, spiritual rock, woo, the way, truth and life and the word. So as you begin to intelligently praise God, you can't help but to have your faith strengthened and your faith lifted up. The uh, Thessalonians says, rejoice always, pray continually, give thanks. I want you to notice where the meat of your uh, prayer life is sandwiched between thankfulness. Rejoice, pray, rejoice again. So rejoice and pray and give thanks. Rejoice and pray and give thanks. Rejoice, pray and give thanks. This is a part, a significant part of how we pray. So it takes faith to pause and to praise before you share your need. All right. Then Jesus goes on. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done. Your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. We're talking about praying God's will, God's way today. Your kingdom come, your will be done. Okay, I've, I've re I'm relating to God relationally rather than religiously. I'm not approaching this like a memorized prayer or something just to be repetitive about. I'm seeing it as a pattern and topics to be covered in my prayer life. And so I praise the name of the Lord and I intellectually think about what the Bible teaches me about who God is and I remind myself who he is. And then what I do is I begin lifting up some requests and I pray that God's will would be done on earth as it is in heaven. So what I do is I pray God's will. So the question is this, how do I know what God's will is? I know a lot of people wanna know that. Think about heaven and what it's like there. Think about heaven and what it's like there because he said, pray your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. So the devil beats on people, especially Christian, good people, and goes, that's not God's will. How do you know it's God's will? How do you know it's God's will? You go, well, Jesus just said for me to pray for his will to be done on earth as it is in heaven. So I just think about everything that goes on in heaven. Whoo, that sounds pretty good. Mm, that sounds really good. Wow, okay, great, mm, joy, presence, peace, patience, woo, all this fruit of the Holy Spirit, the goodness of God, woo, streets of gold, sounds like there's not a provision issue. I mean, oh my, my, <laughs> right? He's <laughs> like, all you need is gold, look down, man, pick it up. It's like, everything you need, right? 
So pray knowing that God's will, whatever's going on in heaven is what God wants to go on on earth. And one of the first things that I know that is always on the heart of God that you can pray knowing it's God's will is he wants to depopulate hell and he wants to populate heaven. And so we pray for, for lost people. We pray for people who have fallen away from God or never knew Jesus at all. And every single time we're praying for somebody to come to know the Lord, we know I'm praying the kingdom of God on earth as it is in heaven. I'm praying the will of God. And so I begin to think, God, what is, what is on your heart as well? And I think things like this, like God wants people free from addictions. God wants people free from sinful habits. God wants people full of joy. Depression is not in heaven. He wants people full of peace. Anxiety is not in heaven. He wants people to be provided for by God himself. He wants you to have godly friends. He wants your marriage to be blessed. He designed marriage. He, all these things are the will of God. You need not struggle with what the will of God is when you think about what is in heaven and you read the Bible and you see that Jesus went about doing good and healing all who were oppressed of the devil. It is the will of God. Oh, my, my, my. And then a part of this part of my prayer life as well is this. Holy Spirit, what is on your mind? I have a lot on my mind. But you taught me, Jesus, to pray that your will would be done. Is there something that you want done that is your will that I'm not thinking about? Is there someone you want to put on my heart to pray for right now? That's a part of praying your will be done. Rather than us always coming with just our laundry list. God, here it is. Answer all of this. My cosmic Santa Claus in the sky. He's like, no, no, we got to have moments in our prayer life where we are, God, I want your kingdom and I want your will. What is on your heart for our nation? God, I pray for our nation to come back to God. I pray for revival in America. I pray for revival in the church in America. I pray, God, you know, these things are on the heart of God. And you, you'll allow yourself to be postured where you can say, God, whatever is burdening you, I want there to be place in my heart for, for me to carry that same burden. So I can pray for my church the way you want me to pray for my church. I can pray for my government, my nation, like you want me to pray for my government and my nation. I can pray for coworkers and friends and neighbors the way you want me to pray for them. So God, let your will be made known to me. And I also think of things like this, that praying with some boldness and some faith is praying God's way, God's will, God's way. It's like, come on, I'm believing that God wants to answer these prayers. All right, we're going through praying God's will, God's way. So your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. And then Jesus said, you can go ahead and, go ahead and talk to God about this stuff. Give us this day our daily bread. So what we do here is we begin to pray for provision in our life. Now, when I have this moment in my prayer time, Yes, I cover, I say, God, provide for, you say that, the, that we'll never lack for any good work. And so I pray for all the provision of God over the house of God, the church of God. There'll be more than enough so we can be a storehouse, even for other churches or works of, that you want to accomplish in our city, region, or the nations of the world. I pray things like that. I pray then over my own life and our own family. But I don't stop with finances. Because some of the greatest, to me, the greatest provision is the fruit of the Holy Spirit and the word of God. So I say, oh God, I pray, give me today my daily bread. Will you open up my understanding in your word? I want to hear your voice today. I want, you're the bread of life. Feed me knowledge and wisdom about you and fill me with righteousness and peace and joy. I need the provision of the spirit of God in my life. Give me some bread. <laughs> you pray for provision. You thank God for his provision in your life and your church and every aspect of your life. Psalm chapter 12 or 121 says, I look up to the mountains. Does my help come from there? Obviously not. My help comes from the Lord who made heaven 
and earth. And this is our reminder, this part of our prayer topic in our, in our, in our prayer time is that God, you are my provision. All right, the only part of Jesus's prayer that he goes back to after he teaches on prayer is this next part. Forgive us our debts as we also have forgiven our debtors. So here's what you wanna pray. Pray your heart right with God and other people. Pray your heart right with God and other people. Now, some people wanna know, well, how do you break up? How much time do you spend on each area? That depends on the day. Because I can tell you, if your heart's not right with God or other people, this is all your prayer life. This is pretty much where the Lord's going to land. And he's going to be like, okay, how about I want you to release that forgiveness. I don't want to today. All right, I'll be waiting right here until tomorrow. Because <laughs> I ain't answering nothing until you get your heart right with God and with other people. It's... It's a painful reality, but Jesus repeats it. And we got good news, though. First John says, if we confess our sins, he's faithful and just. He'll forgive us, and he'll purify us from all unrighteousness. So this is the part where Jesus wants to make sure that our heart's clean. Because people are going to wrong people. Sometimes good people are going to wrong good people. Christian people, wrong Christian people. It's just part. Uh, this is a prayer that Jesus taught his disciples to pray. So keep our hearts right with God and with other people. And then Jesus goes on and he says this. He says, lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. All right. I'm on, I'm on the sixth out of seventh point of the topic of prayer. And this is what this means. Engage in spiritual warfare. All right? Now, God doesn't lead us into temptation, but he'll help you and strengthen you when you are tempted. And when you are tempted to sin or enticed by the devil, he will strengthen you if we have a prayer life that says, God, I want you to make me aware of the enemy's plans so that you can destroy them and I can bypass those, 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 you know, those bombs that the enemy wants me to step on or those, those pits that he wants me to fall into. So now I realize that as Christ follower, uh, followers, our attention is on Jesus. We, I don't, I don't want to give the devil more attention than I ever need to. But listen, to completely ignore the devil means he's probably already winning over you. Okay, I like what Pastor Chris Hodges says. If you're not fighting against the devil every day, he's working harder than you. Okay, there is a real enemy that is a wor working against us every day of our life. And Jesus knows this to be true. And that's why he says, I want you at this point in your prayer life to be encouraged to take authority and dominion over any plan of the enemy in your life. And so at moments like this, I pray Psalm 91. I thank you, God, that he who dwells in the secret place of the Most High will abide under the shadow of the Almighty. And sometimes I'll read all the way through the entire Psalm. And I'll quote different scriptures this, just by memorization. I thank you, God, that no weapon formed against this church or against my children or against my life or against this staff or whoever you're praying for, I thank you no weapon formed against us will prosper. I thank you, God, that you are causing confusion in the camp of the enemy even this moment as I pray. I pray, oh God, you would send your warring angels and they would come and surround us. I thank you, God, that there are more for us than there are against us. Us. I thank you, Spirit of God. You see, whoo, I'm just showing you how I pray. I thank you, God, that greater is he that is in me than he that is in the world. Church, it is important for you to not stay hiding in your foxhole, but to begin to declare the word of God out of your mouth. Because the enemy wants to hinder God's purpose and plan in your life. He wants to distract you from God fulfilling his complete plan in your life. And so the, the, the apostle Paul talked about this. The devil hindered us or he did this. And he's like, so pray for us. He would call out and plead for prayer. And I'm thankful Jesus was a praying savior in God. <laughs> Have you ever find that peculiar? God prayed. 
Wow. And if God prayed when he was in human flesh, how much more do we need to pray? <laughs> Ephesians 6 says this. Our struggle is not against flesh and blood. So see, you got some situations with people right now. And you think they're just mean. They might be, but it's more the devil's mean. Okay? The devil doesn't play fair. But again, and the Bible wants us to know your struggle is actually not against people. But it is a struggle, and it is happening. And here's who it's against. It's against rulers. It's against authorities. We're not talking about, you know, a certain party here in the government. You know, <laughs> It's against rulers, and it's against authorities. It's against powers of this dark world and against the spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly realms. So the Bible's teaching us we, we don't struggle against people, even though that's where you want to blame it on. But he is teaching us we do have a struggle. And to ignore it is to let the devil win. So we got to learn to bind the devil. We learn to say, I bind every work of the enemy and I release the kingdom of heaven on earth in my life and my children and my church and you know, wherever you're praying for and you, you pray the blessing and the protection and the shield of God. You pray the favor of the Lord to surround you and I'm here to tell you, God has angels ready to be dispatched on your behalf but he waits for somebody to call in prayer. All right, keep every plague away from my household. And then last but not least as we pray, end with how you begin. End with thanksgiving and praise. You begin with thanksgiving and praise and you end with thanksgiving and praise because you are not to end focused on the devil. You are not to end focused on all the problems he's creating. Because see, he wins either, he, he, he's winning when he doesn't get any attention in prayer and quoting scripture, and he wins when he gets too much. Do you hear me today? I don't talk about him, I just bind him. I just let the word of God to be released over my life and over my church and over everything that pertains to me. I just release the word of God, and then I just go right back to how big God is. He's way bigger. Someday, we all gonna be in heaven and we're gonna go, if we let him torment us, Jesus will be going, I taught you how to pray. I, t I told you what to do. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from every plan of the evil one. You know, the New King James adds this at the end of the prayer. Yours is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Philippians, the same concept, do not be anxious about anything, but in everything by prayer and supplication, with thanksgiving, let your requests be made known to God. I begin to thank God for who he is. And here's a great scripture. If you wanna quote a scripture about how to end your prayer time, here it is, Jeremiah 32. Ah, Lord God, it is you who have made the heavens and the earth by your great power and by your outstretched arm. And I want to remind you today, and I remind myself after everything I've prayed, nothing is too hard for you. Amen. Nothing. I'm going to give you a quote by Bishop J.C. Riley. Nothing seems to be too great, too hard, or too difficult for prayer to do. It has obtained things that seemed impossible and out of reach. It has won victories over fire, air, earth, and water. Prayer opened the Red Sea. Prayer brought water from the rock and bread from heaven. Prayer made the sun stand still. Prayer brought fire from the sky and Elijah's sacrifice. Prayer turned the council of Ahithophel into foolishness. Prayer overthrew the army of Sennacherib. Well said, Mary, Queen of Scots, I fear John Knox's prayers more than an army of 10,000 men. Prayer has healed the sick. Prayer has raised the dead. 
Prayer has procured the conversion of souls. Nothing is too hard for God. Church, if there's anything a Christ follower should learn to do, it's to pray. When you pray, Jesus said, assuming all of his followers would just have a desire to learn to pray. We take every January, and it's one of my favorite months, if not my favorite month of the year, to learn how to pray again, to learn how to seek God again. And something down deep in my spirit as your pastor feels the applause of heaven when his people learn to pray. But not just learn, but then go and do it. And so if you've ever struggled what to do when you go there, and you go, I wanna pray, whether it be for five minutes or 50, you can take that outline. You can just go through this, these seven points I gave you today, and you will find yourself praying and not going to sleep. You will find yourself having something to say all the way through, and you will find that your prayers become effective and powerful. I wanna pray for us today. Will you bow your heads, close your eyes. Father, we invite you, Spirit of God, to transform our prayer life. Whether we be in the room or we be online, we invite the Spirit of God now to take your word and apply it in our life. That either later today or tomorrow, when we find a place of prayer, that God, that you will walk us through these topics and we will see our prayers be effective. We will see you move in the earth. Your will will be accomplished. Your kingdom will come and your will will be done on earth and you will be glorified through our lives. With every head bowed, every eye closed, if you're in this room or you're watching online and you are not sure if you are right with God, you're not sure if you can pray relationally because you don't have a relationship with him or you're pretty sure you're not right with him, then pray this next prayer with me. If you want to get your life right with God and you're willing to admit you're a sinner, you're far from him, but you're ready to get right with him based on what Jesus did, then pray this prayer from your heart. Whisper it right there, something like this. Again, it's not repetitive. It's not the words. It's the meaning. Jesus, I pray on behalf of my friends today that feel far from you. I say, God, here I am. I don't want to be far from you anymore. Forgive me of every sin I've ever committed, every sin I ever will. Come into my heart and be my Savior. I believe that you rose from the dead for me. I want to be what the Bible says is born again. And so today, save me. Fill me with your spirit so that I'll live for you all the days of my life. I pray this right now in Jesus' name. And everybody shouted amen. amen. Can we stand up together? And can we give God praise? Go ahead, give God praise for how good he is today.